Thanks. I'll invite um, Kate Mills to talk about uh, Coral Wash Victoria. Okay, just checking this works. Before I explain what that is, I'll just introduce myself. So I'm Cade Mills. I work at the Victorian National Parks Association. I've been there for about two years, but I came in as a scientist. I've worked in universities, private consulting, state government, consulted for myself, um, and now I found myself in an NGO running a citizen science project. And up until I started, I hadn't really been involved in citizen science, so it's been a steep learning curve, which is why I'm here. And I guess I'm here to talk about the things that I've learnt from engaging citizens. Um, I'm more than happy to be told that I'm wrong or that was stupid or here's another way to go about doing it. Um, and please feel free to share it. What this is, the project that I had to work on, if you thought potteroos were hard to sell, I just turned it off. Try that lump. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to get people excited about. When you think of a lost ecosystem or something that we no longer have around, you know, actually, quick sort of pop quiz. Who hasn't heard of dinosaurs? Okay. Who hasn't heard of shellfish reefs? Okay. Keep those hands up if you've heard about them. Oh, so these people who haven't, sorry. I oh, so there's a few that have. Put your hand up if you've heard about it recently. Okay. Put your hand up if you've known about it for the last 10 years. Good. So these are some people I want to go and talk to. Thank you. This is what I've been trying to sell is shellfish reefs. It's one of the most, I think it is the most endangered habitat, marine habitat in the world, everywhere. And what we're trying to do is bring them back around Australia and around the world. And the way that citizen science are being engaged is using a monitoring tool that I hate. They're called settlement plates. Does anyone, if you've worked with settlement plates, you'll know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of times in the lab, a lot of time looking under a microscope, sorting through, counting all these tiny little things that it's really exciting to begin with, but after you've done 300 of them, you're starting to just go back crazy. And I had to sell this idea, not sell this idea, it was one of these projects that I guess is science driven, there's a need for this information, so the idea was to get the community involved and on board to help collect this information and try and get them to understand why it was important. So this was something that I hated, so that was the first thing, I had to overcome this idea of settlement plates and my dislike for them. And the reason that we're using them is to try and find baby oysters. So a settlement place in, plate in this instant is pretty much a baby oyster or a mussel catcher. So the way I guess I started was working with just the individual to begin with. That's an oyster. It's a dead one. Um, you'll probably find a lot of them in these places where shellfish reefs used to exist. But they're really cool. And so I did a bit of work into them, found out what was so exciting about them. And it's not on this slide, but the adult oysters are hermaphrodites. And they have this amazing ability to go, mm, there's too many dudes around here, I think I'll become a woman. They also, unlike other oysters, and or sorry, unlike other bivalves, instead of just releasing sperm and eggs into the water column and hoping that they'll meet up and what have you, the female will basically ingest the sperm and brood it internally. So they're actually known as mud oyster, and the reason being is these late stage villages that they're brooding internally are little black dots, and if you happen to eat an oyster at that stage, it's got this gritty kind of muddy type, type ugh, texture to it. And that's where they basically get their name from. So they'll brood them for eight days and then they spit them out into the water, a sort of quite developed um, larvae. And then they spend two weeks looking for a home. And this is where we get to settlement plates. We're using them as a home to try and get an idea of, are there any oysters in the bay? Are there any mussels in some of these areas? You know, if we put the right habitats, right conditions, can we bring them back just using natural recruitment? It's one thing to go and use aquaculture, but that's very expensive. And this is just to try and get some baseline information on this. The next thing, as far as getting people interested, is tell them the history about them. Melbourne was made on oysters. They, one, they used the lime for a lot of the buildings, and two, there was at one stage 70 odd oyster bars in the city, around the city. So, and it was the food of poor people. There were so many around there. They used to, you know, that's from the trove. If you haven't used trove, I get on board. There's people in sailing ships so in towing nets behind to basically get all the um, oysters out. They ran out at one stage, but they became part of Melbourne's culture. The poor people would eat them. They were a cheap feed. They were 
still some buildings left in the city. This is a photo I took a few months ago of a building in the city, and that was an oyster bar, that skinny little building. They used to serve all the oysters downstairs, and they'd live upstairs. Again, it's in the poor part of town at the bottom of a hill because the rich people would live up at the top, and all the effluent would run down to the poor people at the bottom. But it's just, there's history behind it. There's sort of a reason to be involved. People lived in Melbourne and had no idea of this, any idea of this history and the fact that this stuff that's out there underwater used to be, and I guess we're hoping to become back to be a part of Melbourne. So part of the reason they disappeared is, one, back after settlement, we took a lot out um, to feed the population. And then we got into um, muscle dredging. So this is collection of wild mussels. So at one stage there would have been massive, incredibly large beds of wild mussels just on the seabed. And you can see, I think it must have been in 1985, they got told we're going to stop you from dredging mussels. So you see in 1986 they went out and just went nuts and took everything else. So it's a general fisheries. You've got that decline down to 85. It's probably because for the effort they weren't getting enough. They got told they can't take them out in the war. They just went and took the lot. You've got up there, so it's about 12,000 tonne. That's just based on the mussels. And what the problem, I guess, has been, and the problem is, is that's a hell of a lot of mussels being taken out. They're not mussels, they're scallops, and that's only a couple of tonne. But when you start thinking of 12,000 tonne of this calcium carbonate shell that was on the bottom that becomes a home for other mussels to live on and all the rest of it, you've just lost all that habitat. Not only have you lost the habitat, these guys can filter, I think it was a bathtub of water a day they go through. So you're losing that filtration ability, you're losing the habitat, and it's all been taken away. But don't worry, Australia, we're not the only ones. As I said before, it's, you know, it's around the world. If you're from South America, you should feel proud. You've actually got a few areas that have good um, shellfish reefs in good condition. But it's not all doom and gloom. The Nature Conservancy, which are quite a big NGO, I don't work with them, sorry, I don't work for them, but I work with them, have been doing this for a long time. We're not reinventing the wheel, we're doing something that's been done somewhere else. So one, we're able to give good stories about here in New York, this is where they've been, they're doing a billion oyster project and they're starting to get natural recruitment. There was an article in the paper the other day about New Jersey, they do a similar thing and they found natural recruitment for the first time in decades. And they got so excited because they were the ones that had actually put the oysters out there and now they're starting to self-populate. So there is, I guess, a silver lining or you know, a good story on the horizon. And what they're doing, this is a limestone base that they put down through previous earlier works. They've found that they need to be elevated a bit off the bottom due to sedimentation. They put down a limestone base. And then this is a horrible photo. But you can see the scallop shells and they actually have juvenile oysters on them. So they do this in a hatchery. They'll put them out put the scallop shells into an aquaculture facility, the oysters settle onto it, and then they put them out in the wild. So this is all just, I guess, part of the story and what I was sort of getting people involved with and telling them that you know, this is what we're trying to do, this is what's going on around Melbourne, and it comes back to these settlement plates. So initially I didn't have, I guess, I didn't think... I wasn't sure how it would go. I wouldn't, wasn't sure what the uptake was. The stories, I went to all the dive clubs, all the community groups, everyone I could get sort of access to and sort of told them the stories. And other people had been doing it before me as well, so I wasn't the first one, but I started trying to see if they'd be interested in... And I just turned it into catching baby oysters. Can you catch baby oysters? Can you find them? And that idea sort of started to get them a bit interested. The settlement plates hadn't been fully designed, so I involved, involved people in the design of the plates. Um, it's one of the things I've learnt is don't underestimate what people can do. I had someone who's a mechanical engineer and it took a day for about six to eight people to get all these units done. It took him an hour after he had a good look at it and he did it all by himself. So people will come along and surprise you with their skills and their willingness to be involved. So we put the settlement plates out. And you go that way. And this is just for those who aren't from Australia. We're here in Radelaide. And that is Melbourne. And so here's Port Phillip Bay. The two areas, Wilson Spit and Margaret's Reef, is where the limestone has gone out and where they're starting to put the oysters from the aquaculture facility out there. And Carrum Downs is where they're doing some work with some mussel beds, so trying to put mussels out there to bring them back. But as far as settlement plates are concerned, I've got six locations. I actually started off with four. So the Mordialic Pier and Frankston Pier weren't there for the first year that I did this. Um, and I had two dive stores and approached me and said, can we put settlement plates out too? 
And what had happened after the first round of putting them out, there was a lot of um, social media from a group that was involved and a lot of divers turning up going, oh, what are you doing? This is fantastic. Can we do it? And so dive stores are now going, well, we want to do this too. So they're now fighting over, can we put plates out? Can we ramp it up? So the plan is there's funding available to try and expand it out and to sort of reach some spots that aren't there. The Nature Conservancy are also putting settlement plates out on Margaret's Reef and Wilson Spit. And I guess the beauty of settlement plates is they're all the same. So you've got a standardised unit of measurement. And it's one of the things I'm noticing with citizen science and one of the things I suffered from initially was this data quality. How do you know you're going to get good data? If everyone's using the exact same thing, you're going to get good data. People loved it. And as I was saying before, so the guy on the left, it's actually his business as a dive company, and he was on board to begin with. And I think sometimes people tend to be afraid about, he's not necessarily money, monetizing what he's doing, but he's using it as a way to draw people into his business and say, look, if you dive with me, look at these projects I'm involved with, look what I'm doing. And it's a way for him to basically get some interest, get some support, but it's a way for us to ensure that the project continues. He is now fully trained, identifies oysters, can do the whole lot, and can do it without me being involved. Beautiful. And people send me photos all the time of the stuff that turns up. They're really good homes for seahorses. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any of those photos, but that's some of the stuff that turns up on them. And people will keep an eye on them the whole time they're out there. This is the obligatory people doing stuff photo. So this is people looking at the sediment plates. And this is a sediment plate. There's three oysters there, you can see. I think there might be others. So this was after year one. They successfully recruited onto the plates in some locations, which was the first thing we didn't know whether that would occur. It occurred, fantastic. But the best part of the project is we actually had a scientific panel and we reviewed the data from the first year. So we had a couple of professors from Melbourne Uni come in, heavily involved with sediment plates, and they said, yeah, that's great, but let's, you had them out for six months, let's try three months, let's see how that works. You'll probably get more recruitment because a lot of them will die off over time. Turns out they were right. I only, about a week ago, brought in the other lot of plates. Don't worry about the locations, but just look at the variability. That's the one thing everyone that was involved was like, my God, that place is only 2K away and it didn't have any. Why? And all these questions were coming out of the citizens. All I did was show them that graph. It was simple enough and easy for them to interpret. And they started asking the questions. They started reviewing it. This is another one. So the plates had two different heights. As you can see, for oysters, height didn't matter, but for mussels, it did. And so they started going, well, why is that? What's going on? Oh, yeah, we never see mussels around the bottom, but we often see oysters. I wonder if that's because they're feeding or if it's sediment. Or... And it just got them thinking about the world that they're diving in and what's going on. And this was the coolest one. And this even had the guys from Melbourne Uni going, what the hell's going on? This is the orientation of the plate. So whether it's facing the surface, so it's on there, or it's facing below, they all the mussels, the oysters, on that underside of the plates. And like it's you know, very clear pattern, easy to see. And so, again, I think we've got a student that's going to start looking at this, and the idea is potentially the sedimentation's a problem, it could be light, we don't quite know, but this affects the ability to bring back the reefs, and this information can help feed into it. Couldn't be done without a huge amount of groups and everyone sort of partnering and help out. And the great thing is we've got a fishing club on there, and we had guys from the marine care group chatting to the guys from the fishing club. It brought them together. They had something in common. They were able to talk and share stories, and they sort of forgot their hostilities around marine reserves and fishing. Thank you. I could take uh, one quick question. Can I just go for the classes first? Uh, this is a quick, quick one to answer. Uh, what's the species of oyster that you're spudding the... Um, uh, well, Australia. Uh, Australia here. Australia. Yeah, so same one we're working with here in SA. Uh, thanks. I'm just a bit confused about the settlement plate being upside down. Is it still a settlement plate? That's the orientation of the plate. So when you put the plates out, they're like that in the water. So you've got a surface that faces up, yep. and the surface that faces down. Yep. And that's how the surface that's facing down where all the oysters are settling. So the one, the first surface that's on the upside, all the sediments and everything seems to be getting trapped on that, but underneath stays clean because the sediment can't fall that way. Yes. So settle, yeah. So they're settling upwards.
into a um, hydrodynamic, like a particle dispersion model, and actually work backwards. We try and use that to locate areas where these larvae are coming from. The other thing is with the reefs that they're making, they can also work forwards with larval dispersal and go, this is where the larvae will go from the reef, this is where we'll put other habitats to sort of capture that. Great. Um, Yeah, well, that's one of the things we want to try and do a blitz and just find where are they, get people to record all the locations they find. I know every single artificial reef structure since I've started doing this in my PhD is on artificial reefs. Uh, has plenty of work to be done. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Kate.